Thank you all for being here this evening. Tonight is our second evening of a three-part speaker series at Islington United Church entitled Racism in the Church. My name is Reverend Adam Hanley, and I am a voluntary associate minister here at Islington. And on behalf of the Anti-Racism Working Group, it's my privilege to welcome you here and serve as your moderator of this event tonight. This series has been organized uh, after much prayer uh, and planning by the Anti-Racism Working Group at Islington United, and a special thanks to Carol Wilson and Grace Quimno for organizing this series, as well as the whole Anti-Racism Working Group for their input and support in this series. Last Wednesday night, we focused on examining racism in the church through the lens of politics and examining what it means in a multi-faith context. And tonight we'll discuss racism in the church through the lens of theology. As we begin, I invite you to take a deep breath in, find your feet on the ground. And we acknowledge that in the west end of Toronto, we are hosted on traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people. Toronto is home to many diverse urban First Nations, Innu, and Métis peoples. We acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit and by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant. And in the midst of pandemic restrictions, we are grateful that we can still engage in a time of listening, learning, and discussion on this Zoom platform tonight. We want to let you know that we'll, we will be recording the lecture portion of each week in the series, and then later posting that on our website. If you want to look at it again or share with a friend to watch themselves. I want to let you know that the video from last week's lecture by Dr. Brian Caruana is now posted on islingtonunited.org. Also, just to briefly go over the schedule for tonight, we have a time of everyone settling in and uh, introduction. And then we will hear from our guest speaker for about an hour. We'll then take a break for about five minutes and then uh, begin a, about half an hour of question and answers. There'll be time near the end of the lecture for questions. And so if you're curious about anything during the lecture, if a question comes to you, I invite you to grab a pen and uh, make some notes because there'll be a time during the break when the chat function will be opened up again. We're going to turn the chat off during the lecture so there's not a lot of distraction, but there'll be time in the break for it to open up again and for you to add your questions. During the break, uh, Cynthia and Carol and I will scan through and gather the questions, and then we can engage in a more of an informal question and answer conversation with Michael for about half an hour bef before we close for the evening. We're pleased tonight to have Reverend Michael Blair join us as our speaker. He's a member of the Order of Ministry of the United Church of Canada and currently serves as the General Secretary of the United Church of Canada, a role he began on November 1st, 2020. In his time serving at the General Council Office, he's served in many roles, including as Executive Minister for Ethnic Ministry, Executive Minister of Communities in Ministry and Executive Minister of Church in Mission. And before joining the General Council staff, uh, Michael served as Executive Director of the Toronto Christian Resource Centre, which was then a Ministry of Toronto South Presbytery and is now continues as a Ministry of Shining Waters Presbytery, serving as a, as a community ministry in the Regent Park neighbourhood of Toronto. Michael was admitted to the Order of Ministry of the United Church of Canada in 2010 and previously served as a congregational minister in a number of Baptist churches in Toronto and St. Catharines, as well as serving as a staff member of the InterVarsity Christian Fellowship at the University of Toronto 
and as a community chaplain with the Ontario Multifaiths Council's reintegration program. I personally have known Michael for a number of years when we worshipped together at Bloor Street United. I, I certainly, in the Islington congregation, there's in when we have in-person worship, there's the 930 crowd and the 1115 crowd. And at Bloor Street, it's the those that worship on the main level and those that worship in the balcony. And I was a main level person, and Michael's a faithful balcony sitter. And uh, and it's great that I saw last week we had some old friends from uh, Bloor Street United joining us and, and many others from across the church tonight. I've also had the pleasure to work alongside Michael at the General Counsel Office for the last five years, and I trust that tonight he'll be sharing very thoughtful and theologically grounded ideas, as well as being prophetic in pushing us towards being an anti-racist church. So please join me, friends, as we welcome Michael to the space, and I pass it, Michael, over to you. Thank you very much, Adam, and it's a pleasure for me uh, to be with you this evening and to share in this time. I think it's, it's poignant that um, this conversation happens uh, during a time when we are um, celebrating or reflecting on the life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, this year would have been his 93rd birthday. And we know in the context of the US, the work of uh, Dr. King in terms of a nonviolent uh, approach to the challenge of racial inequity in the US. I want to, it is important for me to kind of connect that point because uh, one of the things that is that has become really um, helpful for me is an understanding that uh, King's uh, dream of what he calls the beloved community is rooted in a theological understanding of the challenge of racism. And so this evening I want to, um, you may not find me talking um, specifically around theological concepts, but what I want to do is to invite us to think about um, the kind of theological framing that impacts the work of um, becoming an anti-racist church, but also theological uh, components that have contributed to the uh, racism in the life of the church and in the society as a whole. I want to begin this evening by uh, grounding myself in um, my context or allowing you to understand something about my context, because my context is critical to understanding how I engage in this work. And my context is also important as we think about um, theology, because theology is always rooted in a particular context. And one of the things we'll talk about um, uh, later is the fact that um, in, uh, and I wanna use within the context of the United Church, but when we think about that in the context of the United Church, there are very few, if any, racialized folks who teach um, formation in our seminaries, which means that folks aren't necessarily reflecting from a place of, of um, racial identity or racial experience. And so we ought not to be surprised uh, the fact that uh, racism continues to be a part of the life of the church because those who help to shape and form us are rooted in a particular context of whiteness and not in a context of lived experience of uh, being racialized and therefore don't reflect on the experience of God from a context of where they belong. So I am uh, an African descendant person from uh, the Caribbean island of Jamaica. Jamaica was a, a colonized community and that my ancestors were enslaved people who were brought from the African continent uh, to the Caribbean 
to work in the plantations and the mines. And so that part of my history, uh, growing up in a colonial environment, growing up as descendant of enslaved people, affects and uh, ways in which I um, engage uh, my life and engage my understanding of God and engage my theological um, formation. It is also important uh, to say that <clears throat> I'm an immigrant and an immigrant who, when I came to Canada in 1976, uh, for the first time in my life, um, recognized or experienced uh, where my, the color of my skin became uh, an issue uh, in terms of the ways in which I engage life. And of course, growing up in the island of Jamaica, class was a, an issue that we had to struggle with, but racism in the form where you were devalued because of the color of your skin um, was not something of my experience. And so my experience as um, an immigrant shapes my understanding of my theology and what I bring to this. I am the father of two young men and the reality that these young men live in a context where it is not their racial identity becomes a challenge for them also is something that shapes my understanding of the world and my uh, view around theology. And finally, I would say that, uh, you know, I self-identify as a gay man who have experienced tremendous trauma and hurt at the hands of the church. And all those things help to shape my, who I am and my, my context and the ways in which I come to a, a conversation around theology and how it influences the way in which I come to a conversation around race and racism. So that's a bit of uh, the context that I wanna kind of lay so that you understand the lens through which I come at this conversation, which is an important part of, part of it. I wanna share my screen and, and I'll walk you through some, um, <clears throat> so I wanna um, begin by saying this, that Theology, racism is a theological issue, and it's not um, a sociological issue, but it's a theological issue. And to recognize that um, the, those of us in the religious community who engage in the task or the conversation about an articulation of God, um, we are the ones who have contributed significantly to this characterization of race and racial exclusion. And I wanna take us back and, and some of you may find this, what does this have to do with us? But what I wanna do this evening, first of all, is to, to think through with you some of the things that have shaped our theological imagination. And the reality, and if I can just say, one of the things I'm, I'm gonna try to say tonight, hopefully I can say it um, articulately now, that the challenge why theology becomes, uh, why racism becomes a theological issue is that it is fundamentally about our understanding of other human persons. And our imagination has been shaped in a way that if folks who are non-European are not seen as human persons, and that becomes a, a fundamental starting point in us understanding how racism operates. So I wanna take you back to uh, 1452. And um, this is, one of the papal bulls. And I want you to understand it, right? Because it says, we grant you by these present documents with our apostolic authority, full and free permission to invade, search out, capture and subjugate 
all the Sartians and pagans and any other unbelievers and enemies of Christ, wherever they may be, as well as their kingdoms, duchies, uh, counties, principalities, and other property, and to reduce their persons into perpetual servitude. Friends, <laughs> the image of the other um, having no dignity, and that can be uh, reduced to persons in perpetual uh, servitude is one of the starting point of our um, racial challenges. And it is part of our theological challenge in that we, we see the other as not having dignity and worth. And so therefore, um, you can uh, see, and I, I ought to say there are a couple of pictures that may be disturbing, so feel free to, to uh, look away. But when you think about the experience, particularly of lynching in the United States, that was uh, very much a part of, it is, is rooted in an understanding that these African-Americans, these people of African descent aren't human beings. So you can treat them in the way in which uh, this happened. And so whether it's uh, the Selma uh, riots, um, where um, dogs are let loose on African-Americans, you begin to see that the operation of racism is that you see the other not as a person of value and worth. They are nothing but something else. And therefore we can treat them in ways that completely dehumanize them. And the part of the, the imagination for us, the starting point in that imagination is that, that, that papal bull, right? Pagans, right? Unbelievers, you have the right as Europeans to do whatever you want to do with them because we don't value who they are. So I think for me, that's a, an important starting point that um, in the early kind of European expansionism that um, non-white, non-European folks were initially seen as objects to be uh, violated and used however they wanted to be. And so that, that's a starting point when we start to begin to think about this uh, notion of racism in theology and why it is that racism is a theological uh, problem. The other thing that I wanna lift up uh, in this process is our missionary enterprise. I wanna invite you to take a, a look at this picture. This is a picture that comes out of the um, London Missionary Society. And it's, it's quite a, for me, it's quite a telling um, picture. And it, it begins to, again, help us to understand some of what has shaped our imagination. So here's the white missionary uh, coming to um, African communities, it looked like. And um, where is Jesus? Right? It's interesting where Jesus is in this picture, um, right? Jesus is behind the, 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 the missionary. The missionary becomes the mediator. There is nothing about uh, this, these Africans that, that conveys a sense of, of dignity, right? God's on the side of the white missionary, right? And, and those of you are old enough to remember the kind of some of the language that was associated with the missionary enterprise, and especially when it came to the African uh, continent, the dark continent. We think of people of being uneducated. We think of people of being uncivilized. And so, you know, you think of uh, one of the former Toronto mayor who just uh, died recently, Mel Lastman, a uh, few years went uh, into his mayoral role was, was to go to Kenya 
And what did he say? <laughs> Why would I want to go to that place? I'm going to end up in a pot and eaten, right? Much of our imagination has been shaped in this notion that people, uh, racialized people, are uneducated, they're uncivilized, and they don't come into any sense of civilization until the presence of the white man, the white missionary who, who represents God and comes to God in, in this space. And so therefore, we continue to perpetuate this notion in some ways, and it's, it's a, both a conscious and an unconscious notion that somehow there is something problematic with racialized people, right? And so, but some of it is, is it's, it's what has shaped the imagination, not only of the church, but of the culture because of the role the church played in the culture historically. There's this underlying, underlying sense that somehow there is something wrong. Let me pause and tell you a story. Um, a number of years ago, I was um, invited to be the pastor of a, a congregation in uh, St. Catharines. And um, the, the night of my, what's called the induction service, which is in the United Church is similar to, the, um, uh, to a covenant service. Um, and in, in similar ways in the Baptist tradition, all the churches in the association are invited to come and be part of this uh, induction service. And so I was, um, uh, and they always had a meal following the induction service. So I was out in, in, the, in the gymnasium, just trying to walk off my anxiety uh, of this service. And, um, a, a gentleman came in from another church, spilled something as he came in, and he paused and he looked around the room. And as he looked out a, around the room at everybody else was in the room, he made a beeline to me and asked if I would clean up uh, the spill. I went and I cleaned the spill up and I knew what was happening. Uh, in that circumstances. I knew for him, he saw the only black man in the room and he made the assumption that I, because I was the only black man in the room, I was therefore the janitor. So I cleaned it up, made no fuss. And um, as a service, when the service started, I was sitting in the congregation when it was time for the new minister to be uh, introduced, I was uh, called up onto the platform. And the first thing I did was to make eye contact with him, just to say, <laughs> you see? Um, and and I've, I've thought about that. And, I, and as I thought about that, I thought, what is at the root of this? And at the root of it is a notion that somehow racialized communities, racialized individuals are less than, and we are surprised that they can get to some place uh, where we don't expect them to. And I, I would argue tonight that some of that is rooted in our history of mission, and it's rooted in our, our history uh, pre-mission from the European expansionism, which is a, a, a philosophy of whiteness that has controlled, dominated our understanding of God and therefore dominated our understanding of the other. The other thing I would say is that our, um, as we began to do work around development, we also then um, vilified people of color or racialized people. So we, we present a picture of folks who are, are racialized as folks who are in desperate need of, of our help. And so we, we denigrate in some ways the humanity. And those, those imaginings, I think, continues 
to be a part of our experience and what is, I think, influences this, our notion of, of um, race and racism. So my initial argument is that uh, racism is a theological issue. It's a theological issue that is rooted in our understanding of the other and that understanding of the other as a fully human person of dignity and worth. And that that uh, devaluing is shaped out of our history. Western imperialism in terms of the Europeans um, sh shift from out of Europe to find wealth in other parts of the globe. It's rooted in our history of mission that is um, sending people to the dark continent to educate and civilize and make those black Africans into real human persons. And without our initiative, those persons don't become fully human and we still don't trust their capacity to be fully human even today. And so, uh, the challenge of racism is that our imagination, I think, has been held in, in a value that de devalues the basic humanity of, uh, of people of color, in particular, people from the African diaspora. And that is why you see, when King talks about the beloved community, and in the context of that beloved community, King was inviting the African-Americans to be able to work together with white European background Americans and to offer them forgiveness and love, King was actually reminding us uh, of, uh, uh, of African descendant that in your full humanity, you have the capacity to offer forgiveness and love. And so, you need to demonstrate to live into the fullness of your humanity in terms of working together with um, white folks to destroy this evil of racism, racial exclusion, and xenophobia. Because King understand, understood what was going on. And I would submit tonight that that's a starting point, that part of, part of the challenge for us is how do we decolonize our imagination, right? And in the Canadian context, if I may just go, in the Canadian context, what has happened in the Canadian context is that this devaluing of uh, racialized folks, and, and I need to pause and just say, I'm talking out of the black experience because that's my experience. It doesn't diminish, I think it's the same paradigm for other racialized community who experience racism in this uh, country, right? But in our, in our system, in our political system, in our, in our government, we have instilled in it a, a, a sense that those of us who come from other places and it, especially places that historically we have seen as uncivilized don't meet the requirements of being here. So we have doctors and lawyers and, and highly educated people driving taxis and being janitors because we don't trust their education because they come from a system where there is, um, they're not as good as we are. And, and we perpetuate that, we perpetuate that in the church. Um, you know, <laughs> I'll, as time allows, I, I will illustrate some of that in, in terms of how we per perpetuate that in the church, right? Um, so I think it's important that we, we, we get that as a, a bit of a starting point. I wanna kind of do a little bit of a detour and, and come back, but I wanna um, show you how timid, how the United Church has moved from a, a very timid position around race to a more robust position around racism. And uh, then I wanna sort of talk about uh, um, some theological themes 
that we need to address if we're going to uh, challenge uh, the issues of race in our society. So in 1960, at the general um, council meeting, the general council um, was asked to, uh, to approve uh, this statement. I want you to listen to it carefully. And I want you to keep in mind what I've just said in terms of this kind of understanding of, of, of the kind of human dignity of the person. So whereas we acknowledge the sin of any form of social prejudice and discrimination, and whereas we confess to the presence of this evil amongst our United Church people, it is recommended the General Council urge our people to witness in a Christian way uh, in regards to racially restricted membership in clubs and such places as housing areas, holiday resorts, and uh, further in such areas as business, employment and social relationship. So listen to that, uh, look at it I, on the screen there. Um, in, when we come in a few minutes, we're gonna see that the, the church has moved to the point where it actually says racism is sin. <laughs> you know, in this one where we acknowledge very timidly the sin of any form of social prejudice and discrimination. It acknowledges that racism exists, the evil, it call it the evil, exists among United Church people. But nowhere in what it calls the church to do is to ask the church to look at itself in terms of how it is that it is practicing um, the forms of social prejudice. It looks out in the society. So membership in club, places and housing, holiday resorts, you know, business, employment, social relationship. It doesn't attend to the issue of the church. And you've got to keep in mind that this statement came at a time when the, the um, people in Nova Scotia, um, the people of African descent in Nova Scotia were facing the challenges of what the, the city was doing in terms of Africville, right? So it, it, what it does, it says to us, change behavior, <laughs> you know, fight with others, make sure, but it doesn't invite us to kind of say, we need to own and look at ourselves and our contribution to, to these exclusion, right? We, we kind of, any kind of formal uh, form of social prejudice is sin. So we just need to um, make sure we, we are fighting the obstacles outside of us, but it's not inviting us within the context of the church to kind of take a look at ourselves and to say, how do we um, name uh, racism uh, as in terms of its impact and in terms of our behavior as a people of faith. Uh, and that's a, that's a real challenge for us that, that in the 60s, particularly in the context of what was going on in Nova Scotia, particularly around Africville, that the church in many ways gave a timid response uh, to that situation and didn't address it. Because, and I'd contend that we were embarrassed by the social practice. We weren't courageous enough to say, we have contributed to this, right? We have contributed to it. And so that's, that's part of the challenge. In 1964, the church again came at this, and I want to just read a section of um, the 1964 statement. Whereas the Christian gospel proclaims that all men are equal, are of equal worth in the sight of God, as attested to in the doctrine of creation, men are made in the image of God as his children, excuse the language I'm reading from the 60s, and the doctrine of the incarnation 
In Christ, God unites all mankind to himself. And whereas the Christian church has not always given a lead in matters of human rights and liberty, be it resolved that the General Council calls upon the members of our congregation and society. And this is the first time we start to hear a different tone in terms of a response to the, the reality of racism in, in, in the society. But again, be it resolved that the General Council calls upon the members of our congregation and society to repent of the sin of arrogance, apathy, and intolerance towards uh, those of other nations, races, colors, and creed. Encourage a deeper understanding and further integration of racial and ethnic groups within our congregations and do everything in our power to welcome members of all the races and nationalities into the fellowship of the church. So there's a slight shift between 60 and 64. And in 60, we begin to, to invite uh, a, a repentance. Um, and in some ways, we still, um, although it's connected, it's the, the whereas starts it out in the, in the, in the perspective of um, the, the notion of creation and, and humanity. Uh, it still doesn't call us to take a look at ourselves and how our imaginations have influenced how we see the other person. And so because we continue to treat um, people as not fully human, it, for me, it's a concern that we haven't really understood what it is that we're being uh, invited to do. So I think it's, that's, that's an important part. The second thing in this detour that I want us to, to just want to invite us to do is to think about the fact that in 1925, when the United Church of Canada was being um, formed and from the conversation started about church union, there were um, two black church tradition, well, three, uh, Black church tradition that was part of the Canadian landscape. Uh, two particularly were Methodists who were never invited into the conversation. So the African Methodist Episcopal church tradition, which is very much a part of the Canadian landscape, um, was here and was never invited uh, into the, um, the conversation. The British Methodist Episcopal tradition, which is a, a strong historic Black uh, tradition here in Canada, was also not invited into the conversation about union. And so we, um, not only did we kind of begin to have this kind of timid notion around racism and stuff, we didn't live into it in terms of engaging with the Black Methodist tradition that was part of the landscape of Canada at the time we were talking about the Methodist churches coming together, they were excluded. And, and it's interesting that if you look at the United Church of Canada today, um, majority, I would say probably 99% of all the ministers of African descent who are part of the United Church of Canada have come into the ministry of the church uh, here in the United Church from elsewhere. They were not shaped or formed uh, by the United Church of Canada. And in fact, the United Church of Canada has done very poorly at engaging with black Canadians. And I, I wonder, <laughs> and I say this, I wonder, um, so this is not the general secretary saying this, it's Michael Blair as, and I know you can't always separate that. I wonder sometimes if it's because this kind of imagination of the fact that black, we, we still don't uh, see black folks as fully human. And in the Canadian context, 
we have just kind of ignored them. They're not like us, and so we don't we don't uh, engage with them. So I think for me, those are um, some important um, pieces. So the kind of early kind of imag theological imagination that has shaped our our experience of beginning to exclude folks, and then the challenge of um, our, our history of our articulation of what we understand racism to be. So by 1997, um, we are starting then to talk about racism as sin in the life of the church. And again, even as we name it as sin, we don't invite people into that place of repentance. So racism is a theological problem. Um, and it's a theological problem because it's been shaped in a context of our understanding of, the, of human persons, shaped by a white kind of European perspective about the others, and lived into our, our experience because it's become as part of our social fabric not to see uh, racialized uh, individuals and racialized communities as being fully human, right? And, and it gets perpetuated in a whole host of ways in which um, somehow um, we have to help them. And if we don't help them, they have nothing to offer. And you see folks, that's why during, during Black History Month, one of the things we tried, one of the things that uh, people of African descent try to do in Black History Month is to remind you of our value, our worth, and our dignity by lifting up um, models <laughs> in some ways of, of people within the community that what people in the community is, has contributed. And so uh, that's part of it. So let me shift again. Uh, I, I, I just simply wanted to kind of raise uh, some issues and I want to shift again uh, in, in the time we have. And then I want now to kind of um, look at some of the kind of theological themes that is that we have to do some work on in order to actually become a uh, fully um, anti-racist institution. And it's the piece that we don't talk about. It's very easy in our work around anti-racism to try and fix the problem as we see it without attending to the source, right? And I, part of me wants to argue that part of the source of, of, of this for us, as I've been trying to say, is, is around our theology. And so it's important, and if we're not gonna do that work, um, we're, we're going to be in trouble. I grew up in a tradition. Uh, so um, another part of me, another side of me, is that I often talk about myself as a denominational mongrel. Um, I grew up in the Anglican tradition. Uh, I was formed in the Anglican tradition as a child in Jamaica. I was uh, nurtured in my um, Spiritual spirituality through the Pentecostal tradition. Um, I was involved in the Baptist church. I became a Baptist um, uh, minister, and I'm now in, in the United Church of Canada. And I bring a bits of all those parts to me <laughs> in, 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 in whatever I do. And, and I you know, I remember growing up in a, an environment, especially in the, the days in the Pentecostal church, where it was important for us to confess our sins, right? <laughs> Confession of sin was, was good for the soul. And, um, you know, week after week, people would, would go to the prayer railing and, and, and confess their sin. But uh, so I want to lift up um, five themes that I think are theological themes that are important for us 
as we think about engaging and becoming an anti-racist institution. The first theme is that we need to um, work on our understanding of sin. Racism, we say, is a sin. And in our tradition, we tend not to talk about sin. We tend to kind of pay lip service to sin. And we don't um, interrogate or remember the importance of, of thinking about sin as an affront uh, to God and what God is about in the world. And so we kind of, you know, we can say racism is sin and we, we, we go off and we treat people like um, crap, uh, to put it bluntly. I think we, are, we need to rediscover um, the, the perspective of sin as an affront to God and the affront that it is to God is that we have taken, we have denied the full humanity and dignity of all of God's uh, human creation. And if we don't um, begin to work at what that means for us to say, when we say um, um, racism is sin, we're, we're saying that we have um, behaved in a way that it's an affront to what God has created. In fact, what God has created and named as good, we say it is crap. Because we treat the way in which we see and treat people who are racialized is not to honor their dignity and their humanity as people of God. And I want, I want us to think about um, the, the ministry and the life of Jesus and to recognize that in the ministry and the life of Jesus, um, Jesus was always in trouble with the religious community because what Jesus did was that he related to every human person that brought out their basic value and dignity. And part of the starting point of Jesus' engagement with, with the people he engaged with, who the, the society and the religious community had thrown out and said that they were of no value and worth, is that Jesus began from a point of view of understanding their basic um, capacity for agency. So Jesus comes to the woman at the well and he says to her, give me something to drink. Jesus didn't say, you poor thing, what can I do for you? Jesus said, give me something to drink. And that started a conversation that led to the transformation of, of this individual, but also her entire community is transformed because what Jesus does is reaffirm for her, her basic value and dignity as a human person. And friends, we go about, we want to somehow fix this racial thing and we are not prepared to address the fact that deep in our hearts, we have this question about the basic value and dignity of the people we come across. Somehow those of us who bear the kind of skin color that I do uh, have to prove ourselves all the time. We're not accepted as people in our own right. We have to prove ourselves. See, and, and until we can have a robust understanding of sin as an affront to what God has said is good, that we say is no good, we won't ever, I think, dismantle 
this oppressive, violent system because it starts there. It starts with a transformation of our hearts. It starts with us willing to say, God, forgive me because, right? And last week, we, um, you heard a little bit about stereotypes, but the stereotypes are the things that shape our imagination in terms of how we understand. And I think the, the, the theological theme around sin is something we have to revisit and invite ourselves as the scripture invites us to when we talk about sin to a place of repentance. And until the church of Jesus Christ learns to repent, we're not going to get out of this trouble. The second theme that I think I want to suggest that we have to attend to is a theme of creation. And we are all created in the image of God. What does it mean to see the image of God in the other and honor the other in the image of God, right? I think we bypass this notion of, of the image of God because in some ways, again, our, our collective imagination has been shaped by an understanding of what we think God is. How do we rediscover again that the image of God means that no matter what the color of the skin of the other, they too reflect God and that our experience in life is to experience each other. We're, we're not gonna come to the fullness of God if we're not in engagement with the other. And a, and a robust um, doctrine, a robust conversation around um, understanding uh, the peace around uh, creation is an important part of that. And again, friends, just, just, just to be clear, I think what, we're tr what I'm trying to say is that it's easy for us to go to try and fix, uh, you know, add more color <laughs> to whatever we're doing than to deal with the, the, the theological concepts that, that kind of cr continues to create divisions or can continue to, that can find liberation and transformation in our lives. What does it mean to see each other in, as the image of God? And, I, and, and that's, that's, that's a, a, an important thing. Uh, how do we see? Uh, again, another quick story. I um, I was at a I was minister of a congregation, and um, we I was at a meeting with the chair of my board, who was also the chair of the search committee that had called me to to um, to the ministry, and we were sitting uh, sitting at uh, the table and. Um, a, a gentleman uh, leaned over to the chair of my board and, and he says, how did you sell your product? And uh, of course I understood right away what he meant, but he says, how did you sell your product? And so the chair of my board said, uh, what do you mean? And he didn't realize that I was listening. He says, how did he get your church to call a black man? A Christian leader. Some of you may hear me tell, I've heard me tell this story. Um, I was invited to be on the board of a, a Christian institution here in Toronto. 
Uh, there were 24 people who made up the board. Uh, of the 24 people, there were uh, myself and uh, another member who was uh, Asian. And then there were two women. So we were the, the minority on the board. The rest were all majority white men, Christian men. At the time I was um, the senior minister and in the Baptist tradition, we, we do use that language. I was a senior minister of uh, a congregation downtown Toronto. And uh, I arrived and, um, and this was our first board meeting and I was being introduced and uh, I was, we were having a social gathering and been introduced. And um, my first conversation went like this. Um, you know, I'm so-and-so, who are you? Well, I'm Michael Blair and I'm at such and such a church. And, um, and then the, the next question was, who is the senior minister? And I rolled my eyes and I said, I'm the senior minister. And um, the person said to me, so what's the makeup of the congregation? And I breathed deeply and walked away. And four times in the space of less than an hour, I had the same conversation who was a senior minister, what was the makeup of the congregation? Because for these folks, they could not imagine that somebody who looked like me could be the senior minister of this particular congregation unless the congregation had changed and the congregation had all looked like me. And I realized in that moment and, uh, and just to say, I'm using safe examples <laughs> outside of the United Church, but I could use United Church examples as well. Uh, the, the assumption was that um, the only way somebody like me could be in a role was if I was working among my own people. And to me, that was such an insult to the reality that I'm created in the image of God. And friends, next week you will hear some of the stories of some of our, some of our ministers. But I think until we have a, a, a do some work around our understanding of the image of God in each other, we'll be in trouble. The third concept. I want to suggest that we have to uh, attend to is a concept of reconciliation. We're called to be instruments of reconciliation. We're called to a ministry of reconciliation, the scripture tells us. We are invited to be reconciled one with another. And the challenge for us is that we do not have a sufficient um, breath of understanding what reconciliation looked like. And the invitation, I think, um, to us as we want to do this work around racism is that we need to, to reimagine a theology of reconciliation which empowers the communities that have been um, pushed out to determine the basis of what that reconciliation looked like. We want, we want relationship on our terms and we still, by, by, by seeking to do it on our terms, we still use our perspective of white supremacy of, of kind of control to say, this is what the relationship needs to look like and friends, it's the folks who have been the victim of the violence, the need to say, this is what reconciliation looks like. So we need to attend to a theological um, concept of reconciliation that empowers the, the victims 
to determine the nature of the relationship that needs to come. We're called, we, we're, we have no choice in terms of having a relationship with one another, but those of us who have been hurt needs to uh, call the shots around what that relationship looks like. And the fourth um, theological concept that we need to do is a concept of recreation. We are called to make right. If you remember the story of um, Zacchaeus, Jesus comes to Zacchaeus and it's interesting, Zacchaeus is excluded, um, not because he's a, a, a minority, but he's uh, excluded because of his profession. And what does Jesus do when Jesus encounters Zacchaeus? It's interesting that Jesus says to Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, you have to entertain me. I'm coming to your house for a meal, right? And, and again, it's that notion of agency that I talked about, that in Jesus' encounter of Zacchaeus, Jesus' uh, starting point is Zacchaeus' agency, hospitality. And as Jesus engages Zacchaeus out of that space, Zacchaeus says, um, see Jesus, if I've defrauded anybody, I'm gonna make restitution. Folks, <laughs> you owe us. <laughs> we have been taken advantage of. A lot of us as um, people of African descent, indigenous people, we, our resources have been exploited for the wealth and welfare of others. And we have been left without the resources that are ours and we are blamed for the way in which we try to make our way in life. And we get blamed for that. And we don't recognize that it's important for us to think about as particularly in the Christian tradition, a theology that is rooted in restoration, that we need to make right. And the final theological theme that I would uh, posit uh, tonight is this. We need, in the United Church in particular, we talk about justice um, like it's, you know, we're, we're a justice seeking church, you know, we're committed to justice. Uh, we, we, we talk about all of that, but again, we don't have a, a, a robust kind of theological imagining that sees justice as, and, and there are a couple components um, to, the, to the work of justice uh, that, that is important. One of it is that if we're gonna engage uh, in creating a just society, if we're gonna engage in the issue of justice, then we must, first of all, um, break down the systems. This is, where it's, this is where I think some of the work of anti-racism in terms of looking at what are the systemic barriers to the fullness of life for all. And that's a critical point piece of this justice work? What are the systemic barriers for um, the fullness of life to all? So justice invites us into a place to look at the systems and the structures that we have set up that, that handicap people from the very outset, from the very beginning, and that we need to attend to that in terms of, um, uh, in, in terms of, um, our work of justice. That it, it, it's, it's it, without an attention to the systems that take away 
from the fullness of life for all. We can't be, um, it's not just, we don't create just societies when we, when we do that. And so it's important for us to um, think about and to engage in um, a systemic exploration of, of the barriers. So let, let me illustrate that in, in terms of the context of the church and, and I'll close uh, with this. Um, <clears throat> so here are some of the barriers that, that, that we put up. Um, we exist in, in communities where there's a diversity of people in, in the community. And if somebody from the community walks into our doors, there is nothing that um, they could point to to say, this is a, 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 this is a church who understands <laughs> or who, who is here. My, my illustration for this is um, um, you can always, one of the things you need to do is to go to a bank machine and to see what the languages that are available on the bank machine. And that will tell you who is in the neighborhood. And so part of the question is, how do we um, not wait till people to come in, but how we create an environment that when people come in, they, they, they can see something, right? So for instance, uh, just to push that a little bit, um, you live in your church, I'm not talking about Islington, I'm just using it a broad example. You're in a community where there are a lot of um, either people from uh, China, um, uh, Hong Kong, or a lot of people who are from the Caribbean or from uh, the African continent. And there is nothing um, in your worship, nothing in your building that uh, says um, people from another culture are welcomed here, right? And um, some of you have heard me uh, use this uh, analogy and um, when you hear from the ministers next week, they may prove me wrong in some of it. But when you, when you think about um, the city in Toronto, where a, a significant majority of African descendant people live. Think about how many ministry personnel who are African descendant who um, serve in congregations. Right. How do we remove some of the barriers so that the people who have been victimized know that they are welcome uh, among us? When we think about, um, think about our seminaries across the country, um, if I, I as a black um, individual wanted to go to a school where I would see somebody in the faculty that looks like me, um, that's hard to find. And so I learned to say, this is not a place for me because I don't see myself. When you look across this country, um, a friend of mine a few years ago wanted to do um, some, some work on, uh, on uh, black church and black theology. And um, there was no place in Canada with the rich, Black church tradition that exists here in Canada. There is no place in Canada that um, she could go to to do any work on Black church or Black theology. Her option was to go to the States or, or to the UK. Those are some of the barriers. And so if we're about justice and a justice that attends to the systemic barriers that exclude people from participating, then we need to have a, a conversation, a theological conversation around justice and what justice is like. So folks, our imagination has been shaped. 
we have lived with timid understanding of the need to attend seriously to the issues of racism. And we need some theological work to do in order to um, begin to live into what it means to become an anti-racist uh, congregation, anti-racist church, and ultimately an anti-racist society. Thank you. Michael, thanks for sharing. I, I, I really hope we are all convinced that racism is a theological issue. And, and your invitation is for us to continue to examine how theological concepts of sin and creation, reconciliation, justice, and reparation, how that theological underpinning really leads to how we act in our congregations and how we can attend to those and as we move towards becoming an anti-racist church that we are committed to because right we we love to gather and sing draw the circle wide but how is that uh reality lived out in our congregations uh i would like to say that we are grateful for the financial support that uh, you offer for the costs of hosting this series and whether you're a regular giver to the ministry of Islington United Church, or whether you're just joining the series for a few weeks, I'd encourage each of you to make a donation to continue to support the work of anti-racism at Islington United as the working group looks ahead to planning, planning further events and helping move the congregation in the anti-racist work. Like on a Sunday, you can make a donation uh, at the virtual offering plate on the website or an e-transfer to office at islingtonunited.org or mail a donation to the church.